I'd like to speak to you on this subject. Are we afraid of God? Are we afraid of God? You know the story of Moses? How God called him from the burning bush? How the Lord sent him to Egypt to rescue the people from bondage? And he was sent to Pharaoh to bring the Israelites not only out of Egypt, but back to God. And Moses was told by God, he said in Exodus 3.12, certainly I will be with thee. And that holds true for us today. Amen. If we truly believe there is a God, Amen. if we truly believe that there is one true God, Amen. we also should believe that certainly he will be with us. Amen. Now something interesting happened to Moses. Eight times. God called him to the mountain, Mount Sinai. Eight times he ascended, and eight times he descended. What were the reasons that God would call the prophet and the man of God to the mountain? Number one, to receive a message for the children of Israel. But it's not only for the children of Israel. I believe it's for us. I believe it's for our country. I believe it's for our family. The Bible says that as Moses went up to the mountain, God told him in Exodus 19 and 4, you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So when you look at that ascent to the mountain, that time, there's two messages that God wanted to be told. He said, number one, if you will obey my voice. And then he said that we would become kingdom of priests. He said this to the Jewish people. What does it mean to obey my voice? I've been in the ministry a long time. And I've seen a lot of folks come and go and make decisions in their life that to me were not rooted in the Word of God. Because they really didn't hear and listen to the voice of God diligently. I see people make decisions concerning this or concerning that. But to hear His voice and to obey His voice is to discern it, to perceive it, and to consent and agree with it. People are not doing that. That's why marriages fail. That's why children go astray. That's why things happen that shouldn't happen in our lives sometimes. Because we don't ascribe and permit the voice of God to prevail in our lives. We don't yield to it. And we don't trust it. It's true. We don't. Are we afraid of God? Are we afraid of what God will say to us? Listen, last week I gave you the opportunity to answer some questions. And hopefully that was productive for you. So here's a few questions this morning. <coughs> this is questions before the sermon is over and after. Ask yourself the same question. What is God saying to me this morning? What is God saying to my family? And what is God saying to this church this morning? Now you could write down your answers in your mind or on a piece of paper. And then ask yourself those same three questions after this sermon is spoken to the church. In Exodus chapter 19 and verse 7, after the Lord gave that message to the children of Israel, 
Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all the words which the Lord commanded them. He spoke them. He said, this is what thus saith the Lord. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Okay, we agree. We'll do it. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. Verse 11. And be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you go not up into the mountain, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mountain shall surely be put to death. There shall not one hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, then they shall come unto the mountain. And Moses went down from the mountain unto the people and sanctified the people, separated them. And they washed their clothes. And he said unto them, Be ready against the third day and come not at your wives. You know what that means. What does he mean to sanctify? Moses consecrated them. He prepared. He said, let's be prepared. Let's dedicate ourselves to God because God wants to speak to us. God wants to speak to our hearts. So let us be holy and let us be separate. That has not changed. And he said, prepare. So the question this morning for me and for you and for the church and for America, how do we organize? How do we plan? And how do we actually get ready to meet the Lord? Amen. And I'm not just talking about the rapture of the church. I'm talking about how do we get ready to meet the Lord here this morning. The Bible says to be ready. He said that in verse in, in those verses. And that means to be prepared, to be organized, to be arranged, to be established, to be settled, to be determined. Do we do that? Or do we rush here at 10 o'clock, sit down and think, hey, I'm going to meet God. I'm going to touch the hem of his garment. God's presence is going to come into my life. Do we really prepare? Do we really get ready like we do for work? When I, when I was working at the prison for all those years, I would get my clothes the night before. I'd make my lunch the night before. I knew where my keys were. I knew where my shirt was. I knew where everything was. I was organized. I was planned. I didn't want to be late for work. Do we do the same for God? I guarantee you if there was a famous person here, this church would be packed. If some famous celebrity came here, some National Football League player who says, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian, and that's wonderful. And he came to stand behind this pulpit and speak words to the church. I guarantee you people would be here early to get a seat. That's right. There's no doubt in my mind. But for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, let's rush on to church. Let's try to get there. Let's really do God a favor by appearing. And then we can touch the hem of his garment. Were the people ready for this encounter? Well, in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 16, it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Wow. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood at the nether part of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was altogether on smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Verse 19. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Verse 22. 
And let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up upon Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds upon the mountain, and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Set the bounds away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up thee, and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spoke unto them. God had specific instructions what to do. Are we ready for an encounter by God? Are we ready for thunder and lightning if that would come? Are we ready? If the voice of God spoke here this morning, are we ready to hear that as a church? Are we ready to hear it as an individual? Are we ready to hear it as a family? Are we afraid of God? Do we hesitate to approach the God that we will be with for eternity? If we're afraid of him now, do you think not that we might not be afraid of him in eternity? What makes people fearful of God? I think there's one specific reason. I'm afraid what God will tell me. I'm afraid what God will speak to my heart. Amen. I'm afraid to come to the mountain. I'm afraid. Because I don't want God to speak what I know he wants to say to me. And if I shut him away and I just push him off, then I'm not responsible. That's right. Yes, we are. Amen. Moses spoke the heart of God in Exodus 20 and 1. And God spoke these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness or anything that's in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water or under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For the Lord thy God, I am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. Keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the, seb the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within the gates. God has given specific instructions, the Ten Commandments. And he's speaking. And what did the people say previously? We will do everything the Lord says. We will listen to his voice. We will not make any graven images. That's what God said. Don't do that. We will do exactly what he says. So even as God was declaring the Ten Commandments, their hearts were growing faint, and they trembled in fear. And God brought them to the mountain, but they chose not to remain. Look what it says in Exodus 20 and 18. And the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. They removed. What? They just got finished saying that we'll obey God. This isn't a preacher preaching. This is the voice of God speaking to the people. This is the voice of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob speaking directly to the people. And they're running away. They're scooting. They removed themselves. They started to quiver, to shake, to stagger, to wander. They started to tremble. They became unstable. They were tossed to and fro, to about. They were disturbed. They became fugitives. A lot of God's people are going to become Fugitives because of apostasy. Listen, I consider myself a last day preacher. I believe I was born for this hour to be a watchman, to speak to the church, to speak on social media, to give warnings. 
Jesus is coming. And the question is, are we ready? Is our family ready? Are we ready individually? Are we so busy that we're not hearing the voice of God? Listen. The Bible says they not only removed themselves, but they stood afar off. They were in a standing attitude. That's what it means in Hebrew. I don't like that. I'm going to be distant. I'm removing myself. They became insipid, which means dull, bland, wishy-washy, characterless, unexcited, uninterested, boring, and lifeless. Listen, if we just come here to have a religious service for an hour or two, thinking that we're fulfilling some duty before God, we are so sadly mistaken. That's right. And if churches across America think this morning as people congregate in those churches that they're going to be there for an hour and hear somebody preach for 10 minutes and they're fulfilling their religious duty, they have another thing coming, my friend. Because that's not a meeting with God. That's not an encounter with the Lord. That's not being in the presence of a holy God with a holy people who are supposed to obey the voice of the Lord and be priests unto God. It's not happening. It's not happening in our country. You speak to us, Moses. Listen to what they said. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. <laughs> what? You're choosing a man to speak to you, even as great as Moses was, in lieu of God? You, you want the preacher only to preach to you, but you don't want to hear from God? Is that what you're saying? You speak to us, Moses. We don't want to hear from God. What's going on here? God was trying to instill a fear and a reverence for him that, 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 that would prevent sin in their lives. That's why there was thunderings and lightnings and smoke on the mountain. God was trying to bring a reverence to the people. Amen. Look at our country. Where's the reverence? Where, where's the reverence for God? Where is the holiness before the Lord? Where, where is it in the churches? People doing their thing. People building their buildings. People with a success syndrome. Look at me. Look what I'm doing. Right. One so-called prophet the other day, I don't know if the guy's right or wrong, he prophesied that Mike Pence is going to be the president in 2024. A big name. How does that help me? It doesn't. How does that actually help me? Who cares? Amen. This is 2023. Who cares about 2024? I want to be ready to meet Jesus. I might not be here for the next presidential election, nor are you. What good is that? God spoke to me, he said. Okay. All right. That's the message. That's it. Not America repent. Not America back on its knees. Not pastors go before God and get a message from heaven and go to the mountain of the Lord and hear the voice of the Lord. Where? Where is that, my friend? Amen. I'm not saying you are or you're not, but my friend, that didn't help me. I need something now from God. I need a word from the Lord now. You speak to us, Moses. And Moses said unto the people, fear not, for God has come to prove you. He wants to see if you're going to be faithful. And he's doing the same with us. Amen. He wants to see if we're going to be faithful or if we're going to run to the hills and cover our heads in the sand somewhere. And that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. The reverence of God, the fear of God. Where is the fear of God? In America. Where is the... Listen. I heard of one store that got robbed, gets robbed 20 times a day. Young punks, 20, 25 of them go into a store, ransack the shelves, and no one can do anything with them. Criminals let out. That's right. No bail. Get away with murder. That's right. It's okay. Walk out of the store with a television set, and no one's going to stop you. What's happened to our country? Where's the moral compass? We're not hearing from God. There's no fear of God. 
We're too busy. We're too busy building kingdoms. We're too busy searching for mammon. We're too busy to be happy and to be pleasured. We're too busy. That's right. And the Bible warns us in Timothy that that would happen in the last days. But who's listening? Who's really listening? Where are young people going? Where are they going? I remember when years ago that young people would pray in the altar and pray in tongues and prophesy. I remember them standing in a circle praying for unsaved loved ones in their family, little kids. Now we have to entertain children in churches. We have to have a special place for them. And they should be socialized with adults and praising God because all the people came before that God, before the mountain. All the people, all the animals, all the children, all the adults came. That's right. God didn't say put them in children's church somewhere. Bring them. They need to hear, thus saith the Lord. And we need to have our children hear, thus saith the Lord, and bring the fear of God back in our homes. Can you say amen this morning? In verse 21, and the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thickness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. We are called into his presence to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And it grieved God that his children ran from him. That's right. The great book of Hebrews, chapter 3 and verse 7 says this in the easy translation. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not burden your hearts as in the rebellion, the children of Israel, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another, another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. They had the spirit of unbelief. They became faithless. They stopped trusting God. And God says for us to exhort one another. And what does that mean? To call each other to the side to, and to, to, to have a friendship and to speak to each other and admonish each other and instruct each other, to console each other. Because we don't know what our brothers and sisters are going through. We don't know the suffering. We don't know the joy until we engage in a relationship that's face-to-face, -face, not social media. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Facebook. Look at the words. Facebook. People always look the best. Pictures are always doctored. Right. I don't think I've ever seen a picture of somebody that just woke up. <laughs> with their hair in disarray. With their eyes here. <coughs> I, I, I don't think I've ever seen that on Facebook. I've seen doctored pictures. You can tell they're doctored. Renewing my profile. Okay. Like, I didn't know what you looked like two weeks ago. Now i got to get another look. Why? It's your best look? So who are you impressing? That's right. How about face-to-face? -face? How about a heart-to-heart -heart talk about God? How about, how have you heard from the Lord? What, 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 what's, what's the Lord speaking to you? Because God says in, 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 in Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Do, do we really believe that? That we can come boldly to the throne of grace? That we might obtain mercy and find grace in the time to help of need? People are afraid of God. I don't want God talking to me. That's what people are saying. Because they remove themselves. They stay afar off. And they live their entire life that way. You can't enter the presence of God without being transformed. Listen carefully to what the Lord gave me here. You cannot enter the presence of God without being transformed. To remain near the mountain means exposure. Exposure of selfish desires and hindrances. Becoming new creatures. 
The Ten Commandments were an establishment of a new way of life. God was trying to set them free. But for New Testament Christians, the Holy Spirit desires to continually work in us so that there will be a death to self and an emerging obedience to God. Amen. Self dies slowly. And that's exactly what gets people in trouble. Because they're not hearing the voice of God, or they're hearing it and they're not listening to it. Hey, listen, I've sat down with people and I've given them scripture and chapter, and I've seen them agree with me to go out the door and do exactly opposite of what God said. Can they be blessed? Are we joking? Are we fooling ourselves? Are we trying to smooth things over sometimes and say it's going to be okay? That's right. Not until we come back to the foot of the mountain and say, God, I want to hear your voice and forgive me for not listening to what you told me. Yeah. We condone it. We put our stamp of approval on it. And making those people think that it's okay. I cannot do that as a pastor. I cannot do that as a preacher. And it's not popular. Listen, this is not an easy message. Why is Mount Sinai important for us today? The Bible says in Matthew 5.17, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass away, One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, Till all be fulfilled. Amen. On Mount Sinai, praise God, Moses heard from the Lord. The mountaintop experience. And God wants to bring us to the mountain. And he wants to give us a mountaintop experience as a believer so that we can realize who God is and how much he wants to bless us. That's why Mount Sinai is important. You say, well, Pastor, I, I can't go there. No, your, your Mount Sinai is Jesus. Your Mount Sinai is Jesus. That's the mountain that we have to go to. You see, Mount Sinai lets us know that, the, that holiness is not outside of our grasp. The devil makes us believe that, that since we're forgiven, why worry about those just little besetting sins? Let's not talk about sin in the church. We don't talk about that for the most part in America. Pastors don't want to talk about that because it's not popular. But how in the world can we get people to heaven? If we don't tell them, you got to make it right before God, not before me. I'm flesh and blood. i got to make it right before God for me. But we condone it. We say it's okay. We bless it. We celebrate it. And God says, listen, what did I tell the people of Israel back in the days of Moses? That if they would obey my voice, they would become kingdom of priests. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says this, you also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. You see how that flows right through from the Old Testament? We are the kings and priests before the Lord. To offer what? Spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. But how can we do that if we're afraid of God? That's right. How can we? Hebrews 12, 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we're also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. And the sin that does easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that's set before us. It says in Galatians 5.16. That this I say unto thee. Walk in the spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But what do people do? God understands. No he doesn't. What God understands is his word. And if you want to be blessed. We have to go by the book. Listen. The gospel isn't easy to preach. Because I'm a sinner saved by grace, just like you. But for some odd reason, God called me to be a, a preacher. For some odd reason, God called me to be first an evangelist and then a pastor. And for some odd reason, God has kept me alive in these last days to speak to the church and speak to the people. I'm a little guy. I'm not on television. I'm not famous. I'm not rich. But I have a gift. And the gift is to warn. Why? So we can see people get to heaven. Mm -hmm. 
But how can people get to heaven unless the preacher comes and says, listen, what you're doing is not right before God. Get mad at me all you want. Stay away from the church all you want. But my God, get down in the dust before God. Go to the mountain of the Lord and hear the voice of God and read in this book what God is saying to you. What is God speaking to you? Mount Sinai established that God would have a peculiar people. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen generation. Do we believe this? A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Do we really believe this? Do we really have praises for God? Do we shout those praises? Do we sing those praises? <coughs> are we afraid? Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if the children, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. What? We are heirs of God. Listen, if Uncle Harry left you a million dollars, and you came out of the lawyer's office, I guarantee you, you'd be shouting and doing a jig on Genesee Street and saying, Hallelujah, thank you, Uncle Harry. <laughs> but how about when Jesus gave you a great inheritance? Amen. People come to churches in America and we close the door to the Holy Spirit. And we say, that's not for today. Mm. Really? Mm. Not for today? Mm. You mean to tell me that praise and worship went out mm. when Jesus went and sat at the right hand of the Father? Are you you're telling me that? When in the Old Testament, the people of God were so touched by the presence of the Lord that they fell out of the Spirit. Oh, if that happens here, people get scared to death. Oh my God, what's happening to the church? It's the power of God. It's the presence of God. And we're afraid of it sometimes. But in the Old Testament, they fell out. Don't you remember the soldiers that came for Jesus? They fell over. Why? The presence of the Holy God. Right. Well, let that happen in the church. Oh, those people are crazy. Those, those people are Pentecostal holy rollers. Get away from them people. Really? Really? So go to a dead, dried up church where the preacher won't tell you about nothing. Go to a dead, dried up church where you'll get a book out of a sermon and preach for 10 minutes and send you home thinking that you're okay. That's right. You're on your way to heaven. Go do what you want to go do. You look like the devil all week and just come to church and put something in the offering plate and you'll be good to go. No, no, no. Can I preach that? It costs you when you preach. It's a fight. It's a warfare. On Mount Sinai, he gave the law, the commandments, directions to build an altar a pattern for worship in the wilderness tabernacle. When they left Mount Sinai carrying the Ark of the Covenant, they went knowing that God was among them. Are we any different? All who respond to Mount Sinai, Jesus, the call from the mountain, that come in faithful obedience will leave with the blessed assurance that God is with them. I have to know that every day that God is with me. I have to know that the treasure is in the earth and vessel that I have been touched by God, that the presence of the Holy One is in my life. I have to know that every day, daily. Amen. God forbid I don't want to shake myself one of these days, neither do I want you to shake yourself one of these days. And like Samson did, and there's nothing there. We have to preach the Word. We have to hear the voice of God. We have to teach people to worship and praise God. Hallelujah. What does the Bible say? It says this in Hebrews 12, 18 in the easy version. Unlike your ancestors that didn't come to Mount Sinai, 
all that volcanic blaze and earth-shaking rumble to hear God speak. The ear-splitting words and soul-shaking message terrified them and they begged him to stop. When they heard these words, if an animal touches the mountain, it is as good as dead. They were afraid to move. Even Moses was terrified. No, that's not your experience at all. You come to Mount Zion, the city where the living God resides. The invisible Jerusalem is populated by throngs of festive angels and Christian citizens. It's the city where God is judged with judgments that must make us just. You've come to Jesus who presents us with a new covenant, a fresh charter from God. He's the mediator of the covenant. The murder of Jesus, unlike Abel's, a homicide that cried out for vengeance became a proclamation of grace. Verse 25. Very important. So don't turn a deaf ear to these gracious words. If those who ignored earthly warnings didn't get away with it, what will happen to us if we turn our backs on heavenly warnings? His voice that time shook the earth to its foundations. This time, he's told us this quite plainly. He'll also rock the heavens. One last shaking from top to bottom, stem to stern. The phrase, one last shaking, means a thorough house cleaning, getting rid of all historical and religious junk so that the unshakable essentials shall stand clear and uncluttered. Do you see what we've got? An unshakable kingdom. And do you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, but brimming with worship, deeply reverent before God, for God is not an indifferent bystander. He's actively cleaning house, torching all that needs to burn, and he won't quit until it's all cleansed. God himself is a fire. God is a consuming fire. Amen. Do we believe that? I want to tell you that there's going to be a great shaking, because God said there's going to be a great shaking. It's coming to America. It's coming to our economy. The very foundations of life in America are going to be shook like we've never seen before. That's right. And you don't have to be a prophet to say that. You just have to look at biblical history. You just have to read the old prophets in the Old Testament and insert the name America in there instead of Israel or Judah. And you will see a reenactment of what's going to happen in the last day. My job, my vocation, my calling is to get people ready for that day and to get them ready, praise God, for heaven. That's my calling. Amen. And I take it seriously. This is not a joke for me. I work hard at this in the Lord. I, I, don't, I don't just, you know, throw something at you. Sometimes it's agony to say, God, do I, do I really want to preach this today? Do we really need a warning? Yes, we do. Because I think some of us here in this church, we're afraid of God sometimes. We're afraid of his presence. We're afraid of what God might say to us or speak to us. While God was giving Moses revelation on Mount Sinai, the enemy slipped into the camp. Listen carefully. Trusting God failed. Dependence on the human spirit prevailed. The people looked took things under their, into their own hands. I talked about this last week. Are you in control? Do you take things into your own hands? It's blasphemy before God. If you're not hearing from God and doing what God says and saying what God says, you are not in the book. You are out of order. Amen. They failed faithfully to await the return of their leader, Moses. They took their eyes off God and this will be a last day occurrence. I'm reading from Exodus 32 and verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed, what did Peter warn us? We're on the race. See, Moses is a type of Christ, a deliverer. And he went to the mountain. And the people said, he's taking too long. Taking too long to see God? Taking too long to hear the voice of the Lord? Taking too long to stay in the presence of God? Taking, that's like saying, I don't want to be in heaven that long. Do I have to be in heaven this long? Yes. What, you got something to do? You got a to-do list? Does the doorknob need fixed? Come on. Listen to the attitude here. Moses didn't come back and Time for that. And so what 
did they do? They gathered themselves together unto Aaron. Let's go find us a preacher that'll tickle our ears. Let's, let's go find us a, 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 a priest or a man of God that, that won't tell us real with the truth, but, but a little lies here and there and leave a few things out. Let's see if we can manipulate them. That's right. Let's see if we can sway the preacher. Let's get a committee together. Because we don't like what he's saying. What did you think about the message? I don't know. What did you think about the message? Oh, well. Uh. So let's have Pastor Roast Beef today for lunch. And we do that in a lot of churches in America. And 1,800 ministers a month are leaving the ministry. Why? We're killing homes, wives, <coughs> in the midst of turmoil. Husband's leaving the ministry because it's so unending with stress. Children no longer going to church. I've been there. My wife and I did revivals for years. Been in pastors' homes, and the pastor would apologize to us. Not that he had to. He would say, "Evangelist, listen. You won't see my children in church. You'll see them in the house here where you're living for a week." I understand, sir. I understand that churches can hurt people. Churches can kill people. You don't just murder with a gun. You can murder with your mouth and with words. I've been in a lot of pastors' homes through the years and talked to a lot of ministers through the years. And I've seen their children wrecked, backslidden. Some of them never docking the door of a church again. And it's a sad thing, my friend. Pastors leaving the ministry, good men of God, saying it's not worth it. My marriage is crumbling. My wife is so discouraged and depressed. They waited. And they said unto him, Aaron, up. Get up, Aaron. Make us gods. What? Which shall go before us. For as, for, as, for as this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, what disrespect. This man? A prophet of God? The deliverer that brought you out of Egypt, that did miracles before God, you're calling him this man? Wow. No regard for clergy. And true. A lot of clergy have messed up. I get it. We're not everybody. <coughs> this man, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what's become of him. And Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them unto me. You know, this stuff didn't happen in 2021. They were wearing earrings then. Mm -hmm. Come on. Some people act like it's something new. What did Aaron say? <coughs> He received it at his hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. After that, he made a, a molten calf and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Wow. Are you serious, Aaron? The brother of Moses? You're telling these people that this golden calf, this gold, this is what brought you out? And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. An altar. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. The Lord, this is calf. Not the God of Israel. Make no mistake. And they rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. They weren't playing board games. They weren't playing checkers and chess. Listen carefully. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Go thee, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them. And I'll make thee a great nation. <coughs> what was God saying? He was giving up on the nation of Israel. And he said to Moses, I'll make you the great nation. Moses didn't want that. Moses used every bit of wisdom that he had received from the Lord to appeal to God. And he said in Exodus 32 and verse 11, Moses besought the Lord his God. He went to that holy place and said, Lord, why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. This is God hearing Moses speak. And Moses is appealing to him. <coughs> He's going to say, What will the neighbor say? What will the Egyptians say? You brought these people out of Egypt after 400 years of bondage. And now you're going to kill them in the wilderness because of their disobedience? Moses was saying to God, it's not going to be a good witness for you, Lord. He said in verse 13, remember Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, Thy servants to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and say unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented and changed his mind of the evil which he brought, he thought to do unto this people. So look what Moses did. It wasn't over. Moses turned, went down from the mountain. And the two tables of testimony were in his hands. The tables were written on both sides, one on one side and the other written on the other. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. Imagine, God wrote upon those tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it's not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice that cry for being overcome, but it's the noise of them that sing, do I hear? Hmm. Sing. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf, the calf, and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and broke them beneath the mountain. And he took the calf which they made and burnt it in the fire and ground it into powder and strewed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink it. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? In other words, how did they get to you? How did they mess with you? You're my brother. You're supposed to be a man of God. And you create this? And you call this God that brought us out? You were with me with Pharaoh. Have you been so soon removed from the grace of God, Aaron? Well, what are they? What was it? A bottle of wine? What, what did they promise you? That you would do such a thing before God? As a priest of the Lord. And when Moses saw the people were naked, 
naked. I told you, they weren't playing chess and checkers. They were naked. For Aaron had made them naked out uh, unto their shame among their enemies. And then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? And that's a great question. Who is on the Lord's side? Is this just a religious effort in America, in our churches? Where we come in and we look really pretty. We look nice. We have nice buildings. We have somebody preach to us for a few minutes. And we go home and we say, man, I went to church today. No, maybe you went to a stained glass ghetto. Right. Maybe you didn't go to church today. Maybe you got your ears tickled. Maybe they're erecting a golden calf in that church. That's right. You know, we, we frown upon the Pentecostal ministers. You know, when you go through a town and you see a storefront somewhere, and it says Pentecostal church, people say, what could that be? Hole in the wall. That's a church. You best go there to feel the presence of God than to go into a stained glass ghetto that has 500 people that no one tells them the truth. Right. And we look with disdain upon the little, the small. We look with, with disdain. Ministers need to say, how many you got? How many come to your church? What do you got? Do you have disciples or just bodies in a chair? Mm -hmm. Tell me. Let's get honest. This, this is 2023. Jesus is coming. What are we talking about here? Your beautiful building? Your chandeliers? Your great works? Disciples. Giant slayers. Raising up Davids. That's the name of the game. They're running around naked. And, and the Lord said, and Moses said, Who's on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Now this is prophetic. This isn't my pence is going to be present in 2024. This is thus saith the Lord. He said, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from the gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. You on the Lord's side? No. You on the Lord's side? You on the Lord's side? Get over there. You on the Lord's side? God commanded it. And 3,000, 3,000 died. God didn't kill them all, or they would eventually all die in the wilderness, except for Caleb and Joshua. You see what God was saying? He was declaring something to Aaron. You have tickled the ears of my people and have not told them the consequences of their sin. And that's exactly what we have in a lot of pulpits in America. We have some cute ministers. I just love when they start off with a joke. I, I, I just love when they start off a sermon with a joke and make everybody laugh. Well, what, what, what is this? Hey, I, I like jokes sometimes. But if that's going to be your sermon, man, I, I don't want to hear it. I gotta turn that off. What are you saying to me? What are you saying? The Holy Spirit isn't real for today? What, 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 what are you trying to communicate to your people? That we're heretics? That those people watch out for those people, don't read any of that stuff? Don't read the chapters in the book of Acts? First Peter chapter 1, verse 15 says, But as he which has called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. Because it's written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. 2 Timothy 4.3, here's a warning to the church in America. 
For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. What are they preaching in some places? They've distorted the book. They've distorted God's word. There's no more hell for some of these preachers. Mm. Cheap grace. True. Live like the devil. Come to church and help us build a building. Bring your tithe and offer to the church so we can build bigger. No. That's not the gospel. That's far from the gospel. Amen. We've lost our moral compass and we've lost our spiritual compass in America. And we have people standing behind pulpits saying it's going to get better. My friend, I don't know what book you're reading and I don't know what you're smoking, but you ain't telling people the truth. That's right, you ain't telling people the truth. That's right. Amen. And when you deny the Holy Spirit enters into your church, you ain't telling people the truth. That's right. Amen. Amen. And when you call me a heretic because I speak in another language, it's called speaking in other tongues, which Paul says, I do more than anybody, and if it's good for Paul, it's good for me. Man, you ain't telling the people the truth. Amen. And when you don't preach the second coming of Jesus Christ, you ain't telling the people the truth. Because we're afraid that we will bring fear to the congregation if we tell them Jesus is coming. Yeah, we might have to get ready. Let me close. As we encounter the presence of Almighty God, if you want it, we will come under the watchful eye of God. If we say that we want the presence of the Lord and we want to hear His voice, we will become under the watchful eye of God. God wants to open our lives and fill us with His very own life. The decision is ours as to whether we want to receive what He desires to give us he will never force his presence. Never. His love or his power upon us, he will never do that. The choice is in our hands. Will we allow our selfish human nature to drive us in fear from the Lord, or will we be submit to him? Trusting in God's love means we will accept his will and all that he has for us. He calls us from Mount Sinai to accept all of him. We must understand that God is awesome and powerful as declared in Hebrews 12, 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Will we accept the call? Will we accept the invitation to come? Will we accept him in all totality? What will be our choice? 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12, as I close, says this. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Three questions after the sermon has been spoken. What is God saying to you? What is God saying to your family? And what is God saying to our church? These are three viable questions that we have to answer if we want the presence of the most holy God in our midst from this day forward. Amen. And for our country, are people even asking questions concerning the presence of a holy God? Or are we so busy with life like we think we're going to live to 150 years old on this earth There's an end. There's an eternity. That will go on forever and ever and ever. And every child, every man, every woman, needs to hear the message that Jesus is coming. And he's saying to us, be ready. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you for the word. Not an easy one to speak, but the one that's needed for our churches and for our country and for ourselves. And I pray, God, that people would heed the voice of the Lord and not walk around in the wilderness for 40 years, which some shoes on doing. I pray this morning, Lord, that you would hearken to us, your voice, your words, thus saith the Lord, the Bible, 
Lord God, speak it into our hearts, this message today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, believe, and receive it. In Christ's name, amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming.